Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of July 15th, 2024. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.10 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the Weekly Top 3 also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, Following up on last week's discussion, we keep digging into oil revenues. Second, we explain why it's deeply concerning that while there's continued hang-wringing and wild ideas, there is no apparent progress on South Central gas as we pass the end of the second quarter. And third, we discuss the Alaska anomaly of apparently low taxes but also significant out-migration of working-age families. And now, let's join Michael. This morning, uh, we're going to revisit, actually, some things that we've uh, talked about uh, recently, uh, most importantly and number one here, because I actually heard somebody, after we had our conversation last week about it, and I, for the life of me, I cannot remember who it was, but we were talking with somebody, and they started talking about willow and pika and how it was going to bring all this new revenue and i was like uh you realize that that's not actually going but i mean it's a real thing so oil revenues part two we're gonna we're gonna come back to oil revenues here hit me with number one of the weekly top three well last week we talked about tim bradner's column in the frontiersman where tim tried to develop a relationship between production increasing production and and implied that there was increasing revenues that followed it. And as I described, as we discussed on the show, that's not what's going on. Uh, There is the revenue forecast, the spring revenue forecast does predict substantial increase in production over over the next 10 years, but it shows revenues declining slightly and sort of kicking up right at the end, uh, basically a flat line uh, of of revenues from oil uh, over that period. So I've, I've dug further into this because I want people really to comprehend what's going on and and why these things, why this is happening. Part of it is uh, that we're tilting production to NPRA. And when you tilt production toward federal lands, uh, state doesn't get any royalty, which is a significant part of state revenues. State doesn't get any royalty. Part of it is we is the production taxes is is sort of is is not working, I think, the way that the state intended, at least, um, uh, when it passed SB 21. As we go forward, it's not working the way the state intended. I think the state intended that revenues would follow. Revenues from production tax would follow uh, production, uh, but that's not what's going on. So I'm trying a different way. I've, I've dug into the into the numbers deeper uh, this past week and in, in, in preparing for the, the Friday landmine article that will be on this. Um, and I've tried to use numbers to show uh, what's going on. I've gone all the way back to 2000 to develop the numbers uh, all the way through uh, 2033 or 20, 2024 on a, on a current basis and all the way up to 2033 on a projected basis to show what's going on. It's hard sometimes to look at revenue, to look at revenues, and really realize, really you know, disaggregate and understand uh, how the numbers are are being put together, because production volumes change over period, over time periods, prices change over time periods, 
And so you really, uh, while revenues are doing something, you really can't, you really can't see just from the gross revenue number uh, what's driving what. The way to do it is to break it down. The, the one constant you can use over time is to break it down by what the state's take is as a percent of price. And that will show you what the what the state's take is on a per barrel basis um, and what the state's take then is as a percent of price. And that will show you what what's going on with respect to uh, with respect to revenues over time. So we're doing a chart and we'll we'll try to turn this into graph form by the time we get to the by the time we get to the uh, uh, the Friday column. But 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 here's here's what here's what the graph shows and, and the real numbers. There's two sets of numbers I want people to focus on, but but one set uh, is right before that dark gray line. The 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 for those on the radio, uh, we've got a chart up on the on the screen for for the Facebook and YouTube people. Um, but I'll try to describe what it's doing above the dark line. What we're showing is total uh, revenues from oil as a percent of price, as a percent of what the oil price is. And you can see that um, that the state revenue uh, as a percent of price in the pre-ACES era from 2000, we went back to 2000, um, I was trying to get 25, 25 years of, of data. Um, in the pre-ACES era, what's called the ELF era the for taxes, for production tax purposes, uh, it's when we use the economic, we use gross revenues, gr a gross percentage, but we use the economic limit factor and economic limit factor to try to tailor those gross, that gross tax to fields. In the, in the pre-ACES era, the state revenue as a percent of price uh, was 22.7%. So for every dollar that, that, that producers received in terms of price per barrel, uh, the state received 22.7%. Uh, percent of that, and 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 it's worth noting that that twenty two point seven percent is made up of two numbers. The state receives a portion of the oil revenue that goes to UGF, goes to unrestricted general fund, but there's a portion of the revenue, another portion of the revenue goes to restricted funds, goes to restricted uses. For example, the Constitution requires that a certain amount of the revenue from royalty go into the permanent fund. Uh, it also requires that uh, a portion of the revenue go into what's called the the public school uh, fund. Not much, but but a portion of the royalty revenue go into the public school fund. And there's other there's other revenues that go into into the restricted category from from budget making purposes. For budget making purposes, most people usually focus on the UGF number, but from a producer's standpoint, they're focused on how much they're giving the state. They don't care if it goes to UGF or restricted. They're just focused on how much it goes to the state. So the total number, the total percent of the barrel, total percent of the price that went to the state, restricted plus unrestricted, that went to the state in the pre-ACES era, averaged out from 2000 to 2007, averaged out about 22.7%. That's how much of each dollar that the producer got uh, went to the state, restricted and unrestricted. In the ACES era, 2008 to 2014, that number jumped from 22.7% to over 35%. The number was 36.9%. That's a huge jump uh, on the gross. That means that more than a third of the gross price, not net, but a more than a third of the gross price that producers were receiving for their barrel went to the state combined um, unrestricted plus restricted, 36.9%, huge jump. That was too much. That's what uh, the legislature and the governor reacted to in 2013 in, pa in passing SB 21. That was too much. It was running, there, there, it, was, it was redirecting investment away from Alaska. The, 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 the tax burden on, on, on the revenue was, was Way out of way out of sync compared to uh, comparables, and it was redirecting uh, the revenue, a rev investment away from Alaska. So that's what addressing that overtake, if you will, was what SB twenty one was was intended to do. Then we look at the SB twenty one era, 
2015 to 2024. And that take, which pre-ACES, or yeah, pre-ACES was 22.7%, then jumped to 36.9% during the ACES era. The state, the, the state share of the revenue as a percent of price dropped to 20.4%, has dropped to 20.4% in the SB21 era. In that era, we've got it from 2015 to fiscal year 2015 to fiscal year uh, 2024. And so you can see that it dropped. I mean, it achieved, SB21 achieves the objective of getting it, getting it back down to more reasonable levels, more competitive levels. Um, but it dropped further than in the pre-ACES era. It, it dropped from, uh, the pre-ACES era was 22.7%. Now we've dropped down to 20.4% to in the post-ACES era, uh, in the SB21 era. Now we go to the projection. The projection is um, for uh, the projection that's in the re set latest revenue forecast is from uh, 2025 forward to 2033, and we and we start looking at at what the percent of revenue is. It's not only that percent of revenue is not only not holding constant with the pre-ACES era. It's not it's not getting back to the 22.7 percent that we had pre-ACES. It's dropping from the from the SB21 era. What's happening is SB21, the way that SB21 got set up is, is continuing to drive the state share of, of revenues down uh, during during the next during the next de decade. And it drops from 20.4%, which is what it is in the SB21 era, down to 18.8%. Uh, in the uh, in the in the projection period, so th this is this is what's going on. Yes, volumes are going up, but the share of the state, the share of the state's getting per barrel is dropping, frankly, like a rock when you look at when you look at these when you look at these at these numbers. And so the state's overall share, even though it's on, even though the state's share is on a higher number of barrels, the state share per barrel is dropping. And it's holding the overall revenue through the projection period constant. That's a problem. It, it, I don't think if you ask people who were present at the, at the creation of SB21, and I was one of them, I don't think that, 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 that we would say that the intent was for the state's share to drop like this. I think, the, I think people would say the intent was to get, get the state's share back to where it was sort of pre-ACES um, and, and, and stabilize it so that as producers benefited from East increased production, the state would benefit from increased revenues. And that's not what's going on. What, as, as we're clearly seeing in the FY25, in the, in the new revenue sources book, as we're clearly seeing production is going up, but the state's share of revenues on a per barrel basis is going down significantly. And that's resulting in overall revenues staying flat. There's a few other calculations I did. I tried to, I tried to disaggregate this further and look at what's going on on a royalty basis and what's going on on a production tax basis to, to disaggregate those. In, on a royalty basis, we're staying relatively constant. You can see um, some decline over the period pre-ACES, the state share of royalty was about 11.4% uh, of a barrel um, in, in during the ACES era. It was not that different from that. It was about 12.4% um, uh, of the barrel um, uh, of the price. Post-ACES, it's 11.5% um, uh, of the price. And in the going forward area era, it's about ten point nine percent of the price. They're all staying. They're all staying within a range. The royalty is staying. That's UGF royalty. They're all staying within. They're all staying within a range. The production tax, however, and you can you can clearly see what's driving going on um, uh, in this in this in the whole period from two thousand to twenty thirty three. The production tax is is just dropping like a rock. The during the pre ACES era production tax the the production tax component of price was 6.9%. So 6.9% of each dollar uh, 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 that the producers received for the oil, 6.9% uh, of that went to the state as production tax. 
During the ACEs era, it went to 20.6%. Um, and that's, I mean, that's a huge jump. And that's what's really driving uh, the increase in the price during the ACEs era. And that's why SB21 was focused on production tax, getting that number corralled and getting that number back down to a competitive level so that we attracted investment. We sort of, as, as you can see from in the, in the next tranche, in, in, the next cat, in the next bracket, from in the post ACEs era, from 2015 to, to 2024, uh, it sort of overcorrected. It went from 6.9% pre-ACEs, 20.6% post ACEs, down to 5.7% um, in the SB21 era, the SB21 era to date. And then look at what happens. So that's a, that's a I mean, that's a 1.2% drop from the pre-ACEs era, which I think is what people thought they were trying to get back to. Uh, it's a 1.2% drop from the pre-ACEs era, from 6.9% down to 5.7% under SB21. But look, look what happens uh, in, the, in, the, in the forecast period. Production tax as a percent of price drops from 5.7% down to 4.1%. And, and you can't blame that on, on the fact that, that some of the product or some of the production is shifting to MPRA because production tax applies to NPRA. We don't get royalty from production from NPRA, but we do get production, production tax on production from NPRA. So that's not that's not the result of the shift. Um, to, uh, to 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 federal lands over that period. That's the result of sort of SB twenty one gone wild. SB twenty one intended. Right. This is going down. This is what Brad and I have been talking about for a while here. This is what's going on uh, when it comes to the fact that there's still money left on the table. Is that we have these and this is this is Alaska in a nutshell. We have these wild overcorrections from one side of the boat to the other, whether it's on the oil taxes, whether it's on the revenues, you know, it's high cotton season. We spend like it's going out of style all of a sudden. Oh, oh my God, we're in a, we're in a drought. And we get, you know, it's that picture of the freaking, I should get a video of the, of the pirates of the Caribbean where they're running back and forth across the boat, trying to roll the boat over. I mean, that's exactly what we do. We race from one side to the other over and over and over again and that's i mean that this is exactly what is wrong with alaska right here in a nutshell brad no i think I, that, that's exactly right and getting that picture maybe that ought to be the alaskans for sustainable budgets uh, uh, uh motto or their or, or our profile photo uh but that's exactly what's going on i mean so sb21 was way or, or i'm sorry aces was way way too much Way, a, a way too much of a of an overcorrection in terms of taking additional uh, uh, money from the from the producers and and deterring investment as a result. We recognize that in four, in five years, and and between 2008, 2008 and two thousand fourteen, we got it back under control in two thousand thirteen twenty thirteen. Um, got it, got it back under control, control and, and did SB 21 and corrected for that overcorrection, but nothing's perfect. You don't, you don't think through every scenario and you don't think, think through every facet when you're, when you're, when you're trying to correct something. And that's why, that's why you leave yourself the ability to correct it later on. Now we've gone 10 years between 20, 2014, when we did the correction against ACEs in 2024, and you can see from the, the the percent take, the one constant that you can sort of draw through all these periods, you can see from the percent take that we that we've overcorrected that SB twenty one overcorrected, not hugely. I mean, it went from looking focusing specifically on production tax. It went from six point nine percent pre aces to five point seven uh, post aces, but uh, but an overcorrection. And you need to go in. You need to deal with the factors that are in SB twenty one, not to jump back to aces. God, that'd be that'd be a disaster. But but to but to correct what you did in SB 21. If we don't, what we see with the with the spring revenue forecast is is we're on this continued slide that SB 21 keeps overcorrecting and overcorrecting and overcorrecting and takes us down to 4.1% uh, as a percent as a as production tax as a percent of barrel. And I I, I have started going back through 1982 or 1979, whenever we start started production taxes, but I'm going to bet a lot that that 4.1% that we're seeing, a percent of take by production tax that we're seeing 
uh, in the upcoming 10 year uh, forecast is the lowest in history, the yeah. lowest take by the yeah. state in history. Uh, Chris says, and Chris, I'm going to disagree with you here because we're not talking about the reasoning behind it, but you are right. Chris says, ACEs was an overcorrection because of the VICO bribery scandal. Why does everyone always leave that out when talking about ACEs? Because we're talking about ACEs in broad general terms. We're not talking about the reason behind ACEs. I agree with you. There was some backlash that definitely contributed to that. Um, but again, we have this habit of overcorrecting one way or the other. And I think this is just another prime example. Donna says, useful analysis. She said, I'd like to see the trend lines. Well, Brad said, you're going to try and chart this up here uh, for Friday, right? So maybe we'll see some trend lines there. <laughs> I, I like it when people on the show give me work assignments. <laughs> That's what we're here for. We're here just to get, and your homework, good sir, is the following. Um, yeah. Yes. Yes. I know it took you three days or five days of work to get all this, but would you do something else? That yeah. would take, take another three days. Don't complain about the work that you got. This is what the fans want. So you just gotta, you know, you gotta do it. If you're going to dole out the beatings, they would like to be beaten in a certain way. So. <laughs> um, yeah. So I don't know. I don't think Brad is saying go back to the 22.5% level. Uh, I think he's saying we've got to find an equitability factor in there, and we're definitely not seeing it right now. Oh, oh I am far from saying going back. Uh, yeah. Well, on, on on an overall state take, yeah, probably, you know, 22.7%. All, right. All right. Well, we're going to go back, and he's going to summate for us before we jump into number two real quick here because we ran long. All right. We're continuing now. Brad Keithley, our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We didn't finish number one, which is unusual. Uh, but, Brad, you're going to summate here on the oil and gas and the production tax. Uh, and what your final thoughts are on this. Give us your thing. Well, Michael, what's what's showing up in both the, the past history since SB 21 and particularly in the Senate, in the in the Department of Revenue spring forecast is that the state's take as a percent of price of oil price is going down quickly. And I think that's a sign uh, that SB 21 overcorrected for the problems that, that were created by ACEs. Uh, we've seen it over the last 10 years uh, as, as revenues have gradually declined as a, as a, as a percent of, of price um, uh, over the last 10 years. But the spring revenue forecast is show us, show, shows us that that decline is not only continuing, it's increasing. The rate of decline is increasing. Um, and, and the result is the state's take from oil is not following, the state's revenue is not following increased production. The state's revenue is staying flat because our percent of, of take is going down. We need to we need to readdress oil taxes in a way that corrects the over the overcorrections of SB 21. And we need to do it soon. Sooner rather than later, obviously, because <clears throat> we're uh, we're down the we're down the rabbit trail here. Well let's move on to uh number two uh which is uh again still no movement on cook inlet oil and gas, what what what's going on here? So we visited we re revisited the the South Central gas issue several times on the show. Back in January, February, no, back in March, May maybe uh, March, uh, the producer or the the utilities were hauled in before the Regulatory Commission of Alaska and asked to explain. Uh, what their rules were if there were shortages in gas supply, what their existing rules were if there were shortages in gas supply. And that was that was intended as the first step in the RCA's review uh, of, of the Cook Inlet gas situation to understand what the baseline is, what, what utilities would do if there were shortages. But that was intended as the first step as a predicate to the second step, which was, okay, let's avoid shortages. What are we going to do to avoid shortages? That question got asked a few times at the end of the of the utilities presentation, sort of as a setup for the next for the next uh, uh, intensity. Got asked a few times at the end of the at the end of the utilities presentations, and and almost to a person, the utilities answered, "Well, we're looking at LNG. We're looking at a number of options." And then the question was asked, "When do you need to make a decision?" To avoid these shortages that we that were that we're concerned about, when do we make, need to make a decision on on the way forward uh, on uh, on alternative supplies, LNG supplies? 
Um, and the answer almost to a person was, well, by the, we should have made it. We should have made it previously. We should have made it at some point uh, before now, but we absolutely have to make it by the end of the second quarter, second calendar quarter. Well, the end of the second calendar quarter ended on June 30th. And to our knowledge, to the public's knowledge, there has been no decision made. Um, all NSTAR has done is filed for a $50 million pipeline that would go into uh, Port McKenzie uh, on the Matsu side, would go into Port McKenzie to, to, to transport gas from a theoretical, not yet filed for, not yet applied for, uh, LNG plant, LNG regasification plant that would be located at, point, at Port McKenzie. Nobody's filed for such a plant. Nobody's nobody's really talked about such a plant. Uh, but uh, but NSTAR's filed for that's it. That's all that's been done by the by the end of the second quarter. And and we and and we need to get we need to get on with it. I mean, it's going to take a while to get an LNG plant certified we've got an existing lng plant on the kenai that could be used for this purpose but it has to be the 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 authorizations it has the permits it has needs to be expanded a little bit from where it is because right now it can only be used by marathon for internal purposes at their at their refinery down on the kenai it need, those permits need to be expanded to include the authorization for resale uh from uh, from gas uh, uh lng regasified at that plant and we also need to, you know, be contracting for LNG and a, and a few other things that are going to take some time. This failure to act uh, is putting us in a situation where down the road, we indeed are going to have a crisis because we're not putting in place the things we need to do now to avoid that crisis uh, down the road. In the meantime, we got people doing crazy talk. I mean, there was a there was a uh, an op-ed a couple of weeks ago in the uh, Anchorage Daily News by one of the candidates for the legislature, uh, Walter Featherly, uh, who's running as an independent against Julie Colomb. And, and Featherly was, was re-upping basically a column he had done earlier uh, in December saying, we need Ada, of all people, we don't need Ada, but we need Ada to step in and buy these fields and make investments in these fields and take over production in these fields and develop develop these existing Cook Inlet fields to, to, you know, to avoid the crisis. The last thing, essentially nationalize, essentially nationalize the, the gas fields uh, uh, in, uh, in the Cook Inlet, at least some of the uh, gas fields in the Cook Inlet, nationalize them and, uh, and turn them into state properties and, 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 you know, turn them into state, essentially turn the oil and gas industry in the Cook Inlet into a state utility. That's the last thing we need. We need, private sector signals. We need market signals about what the best way forward is. And the market signals we've gotten out of last year's utility report, the market signals we've gotten is LNG is the best option going forward. But we have to do it in order for it to be a realistic option. So here we are, we've passed the end of the second quarter, we passed the failed safe date, the drop dead date that we have to do something by not only is there is there no public discussion of utility decisions on on notwithstanding their statements that has to be made by the end of the second quarter? Not only are there no public statements by the utilities of what they're going to do, but they still haven't released the second phase of the of the of the analysis that they that they said they were going to do this year. The second phase of the analysis that showed what the best way forward was. So not only are we not having decisions made. They're withholding the information that enables the public to assess and get on board with with what the right with, with what the right decision right. is. They're withholding the information. And this comes back to what we've talked about before, where the RCA should be the one, the Regulatory Commission of Alaska should be the one that's dropping the 10 ton hammer on them, saying you have a fiduciary and a responsibility to the people to make this to get this out there. I mean, again, we were supposed to see the second report, which would have said what they could do. And <clears throat> it's going nowhere at this point. So we're all kind of spinning and it's like it's creating this uh, this fervor and this crisis of. It's a crisis making a crisis, essentially, in the in the long run. But it's a crisis of their own making because they're refusing to move forward with it. Yeah, exactly right. And in the meantime, you got people out there spinning these crazy talk uh, 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 approvals, and you got the legislature. You know, thank God it didn't didn't approve the subsidies for the producers. 
uh, uh, in the in the Cook Inlet, but you've got you got the legislature spinning off and, and doing various things. You got legislative candidates spinning off and doing various things. This is simple. This is very very simple. You've got a report. You said you you paid for a report. Uh, uh, Ratepayers have paid for a report through their rates. Have paid for a report that shows what the numbers are on the solutions. You've got that. You haven't released it. You, you've said yourself that you need to make decisions by the end of the second quarter to avert the crisis down the road. You haven't made those, at least publicly. Why? What, what is going on that, in, that, that, that justifies you talking about a crisis? I mean, John Sims loves yep. to talk about the crisis. What justifies you talking about the crisis but not disclosing the pieces that we need, that the public needs to assess what the right direction is to resolve resolve the crisis so what is the solution here the solution is the rca do its job yeah exactly right the rca the rca needs to hold a hearing that says all right we know we got a crisis you keep telling us we got a crisis we've we've had the the first round of hearings on on what uh you're going to do if the crisis hits now let's have a round of hearings on what you're doing to avoid the crisis and let's have a release of the second half of the report uh, that that tells us, you know, what the numbers are behind the solution. You know, if the numbers say, if the numbers in that report say, look, it, it is better, it is more economic to continue to focus on the Cook Inlet without subsidies or even, or, or even with subsidies, it's still cheaper than the alternative of LNG, then fine. If that's what the report shows, let's analyze the report. If that's what it shows, let's go down that road. But, but we can't go down any road, and we got crazy talk going on. We can't go down any road if we don't see the report. Right. <clears throat> and, so, and so the RCA needs to hold a hearing that says, second half of our hearing, what are you going to do to avoid the crisis? Publicly disclose the report so people can analyze and get behind the, the right solution to deal with this crisis. The, the, and- the, the crisis that we're going to hit in two years is in the making right now. And, 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 and the utilities aren't doing publicly, aren't doing anything right now to prepare for it. And the right. RCA isn't doing anything right now to, prepare, to get the public behind whatever needs to happen to, to solve the crisis that's two years down the road. Quickly, uh, Terry asks, how do we pressure the RCA to do their job and protect our energy? And Brian says, does the legislature have any authority on this? What's your, what's your choice? Uh, the legislature does have a lot of authority. Uh, but it's not exercising it in the right way. The way to pressure the RCA is write letters to them, write, write public letters that will have to go in the public docket asking them to address this situation. Um, yeah. and, and I'm going to write a letter and I will post it and people can you know, either adopt it or not. But, but that's the right way to pressure the RCA, to have a public letter writing campaign that they have to put in their public docket about, what's, about, about their failure to act. All right. More homework for you, Brad. You got to write a letter that you can then post on the program here and listeners can then send to the email. I'll provide an email address and everything. We'll do it. Harold, you're not wrong. Too much wrestling with issues with little to no verifiable data. You can't make sound policy without knowing where you stand. That's what Brad's saying. Where's the secondary report? Where's the solutions? Where's what, you know, they they keep saying we have this problem and then they look at you. We have this problem. Okay. What's your solution? Oh, but it's a problem. Yes, we know it's a problem. What's your solution? Um, Brad, I know we've had, I know Kevin McCabe has has talked about this before and a couple others, because you've mentioned the Marathon facility several times, that it was an export facility that has been turned into a limited import facility for Marathon. And it has, and, and you've argued that this is the easiest way. Why do we need to build a $50 million pipeline and a multi-million dollar gasification facility on, on, on the uh, Point Mac when we have the marathon facility down there and storage and everything else? Uh, they're saying, well, it's not as easy as you think. I mean, I don't think you ever said it was easy, but it's at least partially down. I mean, it's already partway there, right? I mean, it would be easier than building a whole new facility. Well, yeah, it's going to be easier than building a whole new facility. And and even if even if the long term solution is to build one at Point Mac, even if that I don't think that's right. But even if the long term solution is to build one at Point Mac, we've got an existing one sitting in Kenai, authorized at least to 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 supply LNG to Marathon. They haven't 
they haven't done the construction necessary to turn it yet, but but they they're authorized to do the construction, authorized to to at least to supply a marathon. It's an existing one. We have to make some investment to turn it around. Uh, we have to make a little bit of investment to connect it to the pipes uh, that uh, that NSTAR has down there and and other pipes that are down there. But it you know at least it's something. At least it will get us over the hump. I mean Cook Inlet. Cook Inlet doesn't suddenly disappear on, on, on a day. Cook Inlet is in decline, like most normal oil and gas fields. Cook Inlet is in decline. And that decline doesn't, you know, just suddenly fall off the table at some point. It continues a soft decline. So as you as you have a soft decline, you need a soft ramp up of an alternative supply to keep the to keep the supply there. Mar the marathon facility can do it uh, at least uh, at least for a period of time. And if and if Port McKenzie is a better answer, then let's get on with it. Let's have the data out there that shows Port McKenzie is a better answer. Let's have the data that shows how much Port McKenzie is going to cost. Let's have the data. I mean, let's just get on with something. This 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 period of time that we're thrashing about and we're getting crazy talk from legislative candidates about having the state take all this over. The period of time that we're going through right now is costing us time at the back end in terms of having a solution in place when the Cook Inlet does hit the point that, that people are concerned about. And, and okay, fine. Kevin, if Port McKenzie's better, let's have the data on Port McKenzie and let's go, well, let's go down that road. Let's not keep dithering, right? Because this is, again, another Alaskan problem. We see the problem. <clears throat> we know the problem's coming. We know that there's a long tail on fixing the problem, and yet we dither until it becomes a super crisis, and then we make very poor choices usually. Uh, at a state level that become very expensive because, you know, that's what's going on here. Um, and somebody just said, didn't Marathon recently sell that facility in Nikiski? I don't know if they did or not. Uh, Terry says, would Marathon be willing to do it? I don't know. Has Marathon made any comments on whether they'd be willing to be the import facility, Brad? I, I don't know. There was, uh, in October, Marathon issued a press release that said they were considering uh, what it would take and considering going for the permits necessary to expand uh, the the regasification process, um, and and that's the last public statement Marathon's made about it. They but they stated they were they were considering doing that. It's a matter of economics. I mean, right. would they do it for free? No. Would they do it for some some certain set of money? Yes. So it's uh, it, it's it's getting on with the economics. I don't know. I, I've not seen any public reports that Marathon has sold that LNG regasification. That sold the LNG facility. Well, <clears throat> one way or the other, Point Mac or Marathon, it, it, one of the two, let's get cracking, essentially, is what you're saying here. And yep. uh, yeah, the, the, um, the, the, the more the more time we waste at the front end, the more time we have, you know, exposed at the back end. Yeah, exactly. And Bradley, I think some eights at best, he says, just because it might not be easy to reverse the flow at Marathon doesn't mean it's not possible and doesn't mean that it might not in the long run be cheaper than building a whole new plant and getting a whole new plant permitted and getting all the, I mean, it's not just building it, it's the permits and everything else that are attached to it that take the time. And if you've got something already stood up, well, there you go. So... Uh, but we've got to have the information. We've got to have you know, decision making is easy once you have all the facts. And we have about half the facts here and a lot of supposition going on. And this and this isn't a situation where, you know, private enterprise gets to keep their should keep their, their information private in a competitive market. This is an this is a situation where we've got a, 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 a monopoly in terms of NSTAR and the other utilities. They're making decisions that will affect the public. So the public has a right to yeah. know the information that uh, that they're considering. Yeah, maybe we should commission a study that studies the study of the previous study that we already studied before we study the final study. I'm just saying, uh, I'm gonna form a new company just for that right there. Okay, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, the weekly top three, what we lovingly call Truth Tuesdays. Trying to give you a little truth. It may hurt, but it's just the truth. Uh, we're gonna talk now about the Alaska anomaly, which has to do with the Alaska workforce. Brad, I got some charts here that you threw me. So uh, let's uh, let's get to it here. What do we got? So so there was a, a an article from January popped up in my feed someplace uh, in one of the social media feeds. Somebody was making the point that 
that people are fleeing high tax states to to low tax states, and they they attached an article, a, a good analysis from the Tax Foundation, Conservative Tax Foundation, that focuses on uh, focuses on this issue. And and here's what the Tax Foundation said: that that, that that indeed there is a population shift going on. Americans were on the move, and many chose low tax state over high tax ones. The population shift paints a clear picture. Alaskans or America, excuse me. The pop the population shift paints a clear picture. Americans are leaving high tax, high cost of living states in favor of low tax, low cost alternatives. Of the 32 states whose overall tax, state and local tax burdens per capita were below the national average in 2022, 24 experienced net bound, net, uh, bound migration in 2023. And, and, and they go on to explain that, um, that there's this, this giant move going on uh, that, that, uh, that, is, that is focused on uh, people moving from high tax states to low tax states. Here's here's the interesting fact of it. Alaska is one of the lowest tax states. When you look at the tax factors that the Tax Foundation and the study on which they were basing their 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 article uh, uh, works, they they were looking at state and local taxes and and state and local taxes, sales, property taxes, other things. And Alaska always comes in as one of the lowest tax states when you do that ana that analysis. But when they talk about where people are moving, the U.S. Census Bureau's most recent interstate migration shows that New York lost the greatest share of its population, a high tax state, to other states between 20, July 2022 and July 2023. Not far behind was California, another high tax state, which lost 9.9% 9 .9 of its residents, followed by Hawaii, another high tax state, 0.8%. Illinois, 0.7%, uh, uh, another high tax state. Included in that group, Alaska. This is what it says. Not far behind was California, Hawaii, Alaska, and Illinois. So what the heck's going on here? I mean, the Alaska anomaly is we say we've got low taxes um, and, and we say that we have, you know, that we're welcoming in terms of in terms of migration. But we have people leaving us as if we were a high tax state. We are in the same sentence in terms of net migration, net out migration. We are in the same sentence with California, Hawaii, and Illinois. Alaska's in that same sentence. So the, the anomaly is what the heck's going on? And, and I want to sort of refocus on, a, on an analysis we did earlier in the year uh, that looks at this. The, it's, it, we did an Alaska landmine column that said, what's really going on with working age Alaska families? That's when the big mantra down at the legislature was, oh, we're losing working age Alaska families. We have to do things uh, to, to, you know, to save, uh, to bring people back, uh, that we have this out migration going on. And here's the chart. Here's the chart we did. Michael's got it up on the screen. For those on the radio, I'll try to talk through it. Here's the chart we did looking at uh, federal income tax data and 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 where the 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 income of families that were filing federal income tax returns. And that's one way of following the by income bracket, following who's who's staying, if the numbers are going up, if the number of returns filed from a certain state are going up, then people are increasing uh, in that state. The number if the number of returns go down, you can generalize that the number of people in the, in those income brackets are are leaving the state. And uh, and and the there is no confusion about what these numbers show. These numbers show that in the in the income brackets of $200,000 of income, gross uh, adjusted gross income, $200,000 and up, the the number of uh, the, the the people uh, in Alaska are increasing. We have net in migration and these are people 60 and below, age 60 and below. We have net in migration of people with incomes of $200,000 and and above. We're attracting people with with high incomes, but in terms of incomes of two hundred thousand dollars and below, we're losing people, and we're losing more and more people the the lower the income levels go. Those that is where the out migration is among working Alaska families. So when you when you look at the Alaska anomaly, why with these apparent low taxes are we having out migration? You at least can see 
the out migration is going on in the in the lower income brackets and in my and, and increased in migration is going on above it, 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 in the upper income brackets we're having net uh, in migration so what's the cause of that and one thing you can you can tie this to one thing that overlays on this very neatly is the impact of PFD cuts that PFD cuts take more and more and more. They're, they're hugely regressive. They take more and more and more the lower, the lower your income. So middle and lower income Alaska families pay much more as a percent of income uh, than uh, upper income uh, Alaska families. And Michael's got a chart here that shows the level of government take, including PFD cuts uh, from Alaska families. And you can show from the fourth 20%, which is about, about 150,000 from the fourth 20% on the, the, the tax bite, the level of take on Alaska families is growing significantly. The upper income are paying less as a, as a percent of income uh, than uh, the middle and lower income Alaska families. So the upper income is, is growing. The number of the people in the upper income brackets are growing. The number of people in the lower income brackets is declining. Working age families, age less, 60 and less, uh, are are declining. What that's telling me is is frankly that Alaska does have a tax, and that and that it's impacting Alaska in exactly the same way as it's impacting California, Illinois, uh, and the other high cost states. And that tax is coming in the form of PFD cuts. It is it is removing income from lower and from middle and lower income Alaska families disproportionately from upper end from upper income families. Those families are leaving Alaska, middle and lower income Alaska families are leaving Alaska in the same way that you see in California, Illinois, New York, Hawaii, the other states that Alaska is listed with uh, in this analysis, they're leaving Alaska in the same way. And upper income people who don't have to, who don't have to, who are not adversely affected by PFD cuts are coming to Alaska. Um, and so, you know, it, it's great that we're getting upper income people, but we're bleeding out middle and lower income Alaska families. 80% of Alaska families fall in the middle and lower income brackets, and we're bleeding those people out. So I think, I think, the, I think the Alaska anomaly that shows up in these tax numbers is explained by the impact of PFD cuts. And, and all, of these, all of these analyses that don't look at PFD cuts as taxes are missing the point of what's driving the Alaska uh, the Alaska response. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. And we've seen this, Brad, again and again and again, where we're looking at this and we know that specifically this is because um, they have continued to spend at an unsustainable rate and the PFD is the only thing there. And that's what's driving more and more of these working age, especially the younger Alaskans out who are trying to get a toehold. They're trying to make twenty-five or thirty or forty thousand dollars a year, and yet they're being taxed at an incredible rate when you compare it to other states. Yep, exactly right. And the and the top income brackets, the ones that we're getting anyway, the top income brackets are being subsidized by those PFD cuts. Essentially, PFD cuts are going to pay the taxes the top twenty percent otherwise uh, should pay. Top twenty percent non-residents and and the oil companies otherwise should be paying. PFD cuts are being used to subsidize those. And, and the consequence is we're losing, we're bleeding out 80% uh, people across 80% of the, of the income brackets in Alaska, middle and lower income brackets in Alaska. It, it, that explains the Alaska anomaly. And, and, and people who are trying to find different reasons for it really aren't touching on the real reason. All right, Brad. So 60 seconds, how do we fix it? I mean, how, <laughs> how, how do we fix it? Give it to me quick here. Well, we need to do two things. We need to we need to we need to make the tax recognizing that PFD cuts are taxes. We need to make the tax broader. We need to include non-residents. We need to get a part of the oil income that we're losing as a result of of SB twenty one overcorrecting. Uh, we need to we need to address those other brackets, and we need to have the top twenty percent pay a proportionate share of the cost, along with and 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 use that revenue then to reduce the burden on middle and lower income brackets. That will also, I think, reduce spending 
because yeah. once the top 20% non-residents and oil companies have to pay for spending, they're going to push back on spending. They'll get involved at that point instead of just, oh, hey, it's high cotton season. Somebody else will pay. Now we have to pay. It's a thing. That chart is pretty stark. When you look at that chart, that chart is uh, is pretty uh, is pretty damn uh, stark. I'm going to pull it back up there again here so people, come on, my thing was not cooperating. When you look at that, that one chart there and you look at the the take the lowest 20 percent is taking a 20 22 percent bath versus the top 20 percent taking seven percent or lower all the way up to three and a half percent if you're in the top one percent but you just look at that and even in the middle class i mean they're 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 getting soaked for 10 percent on the way by and you wonder why people are leaving because Alaska was already an expensive place to live. And now as a cost per capita, as far as income, you're taking a big chunk of their income out the door. Yeah. What what I think what I think this list leads you to, to, to think about is PFDs were really a way of softening the high cost of Alaska for middle and lower income Alaska families. And and it was a supplemental source of income from a, from a heritage uh, from a heritage source of income, you know, permanent fund earnings, invested permanent fund, invested permanent fund, and permanent fund earnings. It, it was a way of softening the cost of living. As we're stripping that away, as we're taxing away PFD cuts, we're exposing middle and lower income Alaska families to the Alaska high cost of living in a way we haven't before. And we're protecting the top 20% non-residents and oil companies from experiencing the same high cost of living because we're paying their share of taxes for, for state government. And so, and so as, as middle and lower income Alaskans sort of address this, um, a high cost of living, not getting softened by, by PFDs, they're leaving. I mean, that's what the data tells you. They're leaving. And that's why we have the Alaskan anomaly showing up in these, in these national tax views of, of why is Alaska, uh, which claims to have low taxes, but why is Alaska showing up in the same category as California, Illinois, and Hawaii. Why is it in that bracket of out-migration as opposed to, as opposed to the a net in-migration that, that the tax analysis would tend right. to make you think? And well, it's because we're taking away, we're taking away the PFDs from middle and lower income Alaska families and taking away that softening impact on the high cost of living. Because they list, they list Alaska as a low tax state, yet we're in, we're in amongst all the highest tax states as far as out migration. And this may answer Randy's comment, which is, this is supposed to be Truth Tuesday. It's not true that PFD cuts are a true tax. Anyone who believes that rhetoric may not understand the definition of a government tax. But I think I will take Matt Berman's point of view over yours, Randy, since he's a economist and a tax. I mean, he's the one that said it is a tax. Maybe not fitting into your cozy little definition of what a tax is, but it is a tax. And, and that's what Berman says. And that's what those out migration numbers show. I mean, on paper, Alaska may be a low tax state, but in reality, when they take that much of your income, it's a tax. Well, let's not, let's call it something else. It's a reduction in income. No one can argue it's not a reduction in income. Taxes are reductions in income, but no one can argue the PFD cuts aren't reductions in income. And that's what we're doing to middle and lower income Alaska families. We're taking away the PFD income that offset the high cost of, of Alaska living. And, and, we're, and we're shifting the benefit of that over to the top 20%. So we're getting a lot more top 20% in. Hooray, yay for us. But we're not getting 80%. We're losing the right. 80%. We're losing the bulk of Alaska families, the middle and lower income Alaska families. That's the workers. You talk about a worker shortage. Well, it's because we're driving them out of the state in a way that looks a lot like California, Illinois, and Hawaii. And why are we driving them? At, how are we driving them out of the state? We're taking away the benefit that PFDs gave against uh, against the high cost of living. Ron Gillum says, so a 15% flat tax would essentially give lower income families a raise and cause the upper 20% to pay their fair share. Is that a fair statement? It is a fair statement. We don't need a 15% flat tax. More like a 5% flat tax would would be sufficient if you include non-residents and you include some pickup from, from the oil companies. But that's exactly right. It would give lower middle. I mean, people always talk about lower. It would give middle, the 60% that are in the middle, it would give middle income families a raise. Yeah, because again, according to that chart, middle income families are paying over 10%. 
So again, a 5% flat tax would give everybody from the 80% down a raise and then spread the burden higher uh, with the, with the higher uh, uh, income brackets as well. Yep. Uh, all right, Brad, I uh, got a minute and a half here. So final thoughts on all these things we just hit on today is a lot, uh, but your final thoughts here for today. Well, Michael, I, I think I think the final thought is summed up by the Pirates of the Caribbean, right? I think it's summed up by we run from one side of the boat on on uh, on on you know the the Cook Inlet gas. We run from one side of the boat on uh, oil revenues, uh, oil taxes. We run from one side of the boat on PFDs. We want we, we run from one side of the boat to the other, and and and. <laughs> And and we're not doing a good job on any of it. I mean, we're 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 stretching out the transition period on Cook Inlet gas by not addressing the issue now, just hitting it straight on and doing the doing what the economics tell us we ought to be doing. We're not doing the right thing with oil revenues, with oil taxes, because we run to the other side, but we're not correcting for having, you know, tipping over on that side and coming back to the middle. And we're doing the right. We're doing the same thing with the Alaska anomaly. We're doing the same thing by overtaxing middle and lower income Alaska families, um, and and subsidizing the top twenty percent. And we're losing workers. We have out migration as a result of that, on par with California, Texas, or California, uh, Hawaii, and Illinois. We're having out migration because we've overcorrected uh, uh, by how we're dealing with the PFD. All right, Brad, I think that's it for today, my friend. As always, it's great stuff. I appreciate you being part of it today. Thanks for coming on board and joining us. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Have a great uh, have a great week, my friend. Thanks for coming on board. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.